so I'm going to have to Okay, thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our lecture on um, the RAI's February meeting. I'm just trying to remember which month it is. I'm a bit confused at this stage. I think it's definitely still February. Um, tonight we have a double act. Um, Lisa Westcott Wilkins has over 20 years of professional professional experience in communications, finance, and journalism, uh, which includes several years as editor of Current Archaeology magazine. She has a master's degree in archaeology from UCL and also a CLAW fellowship. She now focuses her energy on field archaeology and harnessing digital and creative innovations for dig ventures, about which you will hear more in the talk. She is an international speaker on digital outreach and crowdfunding for the creative and cultural sectors and leads on the consultancy aspect of dig ventures work. Tonight, we also have Brendan Wilkins, who is a field archaeologist with over 20 years experience directing and managing large complex sites in advance of major construction projects, such as motorways, pipelines and railways, of which there are not many on Lindisfarne. No. <laughs> but with a consistent research and publication record, he has lectured internationally on wetland archaeology, Irish archaeology and new advances in excavation myth methodology. He is currently finishing off a PhD at the University of Leicester entitled Digging the Crowd, the Future of Archaeology in the Digital and Collaborative Economies. Uh, tonight, um, Lisa and Brendan are going to be talking about Lindisfarne, new research and new ways of working, the Dig Ventures model in action. So welcome to both of you and you. off you go. <laughs> Very, very nice to be here. So we're just gonna get the screen share going and start with the presentation. Um, let's see, here we go. Share and then I'll just start the presentation. Great. Nice. So here we go. Um, as Lindsay was just saying, we uh, we were um, going to come here tonight and talk to you all about Lindisfarne, which uh, hopefully you've all have heard of the project. Um, but as we were writing the presentation, which so often happens, we realized that we can't really talk about the model and, and how it works on Lindisfarne with, without actually addressing how different things have been over the last couple of years as a result of COVID and many other things. Lindsay, having visited the dig this summer said, oh, I thought it was really interesting how you had a one-way system in your trenches and some of the other mitigations that we, we've done on our digs to make it possible to carry on working. But that extends even further into our actual practice. So this is not the talk that you're getting tonight. The talk that you're getting tonight is from zero to working with Attenborough in 10 years, what the heck is going on over here? With some small <laughs> bits of Lindisfarne thrown in. <laughs> yeah, there will be some Lindisfarne for those of you who are only here because of Lindisfarne and plenty plenty of resources, I promise. So um, first we thought we would introduce who Dig Ventures is for those of you who haven't really met us before. And so we're gonna start with the model um, and then how that, that way of working ended us up on Lindisfarne and what's actually happening with that project. Um, what happens next and how COVID has changed our model and the way that we actually do archaeology. And then what's actually happening now, uh, Deep Time, which is our latest project and beyond. So that's the structure of the talk this evening, starting with who are we? So who is Dick Ventures? Well, we're a social business. Um, we design and we deliver digital um, archaeology projects that enable the civic sector to get involved in archaeological research. And we were founded in 2012 uh, by two archaeologists and a dog. And what are we yeah, now? We're, well, we're like between 15 and 20 archaeologists and two dogs. Well, so we're, you know, on. I'd like to even the balance out. <laughs> Definitely <some> growing. <laughs> um, so we use crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, and digital technology to increase opportunities for the public to get involved in archaeological research um, at every stage in the process. Now, though we were launched in some quite difficult um, and tough economic conditions. Alternative finance wasn't really um, the, the, the main driver. We wanted to know whether a digital or networked or peer-to-peer -peer approach um, to archaeology could help deliver better, more impactful, more collaborative research. So how did it all begin? Um, well, I have to say, uh, I blame the dog. In my long career in commercial sector archaeology, I'd always suspected that archaeology was insanely popular but it really wasn't until we strapped a gopro camera onto our dog fergus that it really romped home um, it was the summer of 2012 and a friend great friend of ours had just taken over the management of flag fan which i'm sure you're all 
aware of, a, a fantastic Bronze Age wetland site just outside Peterborough. Now, the site was in pretty serious trouble um, since the original excavations had finished in the 2000s. Um, visitor numbers to the site had, had dried up. Um, and that left a, a real shortfall in terms of the finance to deal with the archaeology, which was also drying out. Now, we've become aware of um, a crowdfunding Kickstarter had just very recently launched in, in the US and was having great success with creative uh, projects, particularly uh, media and film. So we thought we'd give it a go at Flag Fen. And within three months, we'd raised some £32,000 from 250 people with members of the public flying in from all over the world to join us, as well as from, from down the road where they could roll their sleeves up and join in. Now, very impressive numbers, as you can see here. But in many respects, just, just raising the money was one of the least interesting things out of that experiment. It was really eclipsed by the non-financial benefits of people rolling their sleeves up and joining in with the excavations on site. And the ripple effects of, a, of, of having and, and, and positioning archaeology in that way were also just as, as equally impressive. Nearly 2,000 people joined the dig, uh, came to watch the dig over the three weeks that we, that we were there. That's a 30% year-on-year increase in terms of visitor numbers, representing um, 60 percent of their annual gate fees and many of those people um, had never been to the site before and many of those people were local so we found that in addition to generating income to pay for the archaeology and um, we found new ways that could build audiences around the site uh, both digital and physical working towards the financial long-term sustainability um, using archaeology as a heritage-led regeneration since then, we've gone on to do that a further 45 um, sites around the UK, um, some in Europe and some in the US, raising some two, two million in match crowd and grant funding. And generally, we average around about a thousand dig participants a year with some three and a half thousand um, children and some 15,000 open day visitors. And we found that the same um, uh, uh, impact, the same outcomes um, work on this site just as they did um, at Flag Fen, they work on other sites as well. Um, so we felt, thought, well, this is potentially the way forward, and it's at that point we, we gave our day jobs up, and we've been doing this ever since. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so how how did we basically end up on Lindisfarne? Um, that's what I want to talk about next. But first, I wanted to just share a, a little bit of a clip that sort of situates the work that we're doing there. So here we go. Lindisfarne isn't necessarily known as being an archaeological site, but it's more of a moment. Wow! Yeah. Some lovely coins. The trowel to reveal all. On a scale of 1 to 10, how cool is it? Uh, you don't know what it is. No point doing archaeology as to telling people about it. Right. We're not just being cagey, uh, we're being good archaeologists. So that was actually um, just a, a trailer for our series, Why We Did, which is filmed on uh, Lindisfarne. It's four episodes, half an hour each, which really does provide quite a lot of background, um, certainly of our first season back into the field after COVID. So as you saw there, um, we don't know what it is. We are mid-project. Um, so part of what we can talk about today is what's happened so far, but obviously we're still, we've still got a few more seasons in the field before we can draw any like real definitive conclusions. We are working on an interim report, which will be out sort of more momentarily. And obviously we'll be sharing that through all of our channels once it is. So how do we end up there? Um, the project is run in partnership with Durham University, Dr. David Petz. I love to tell this story because it's so adorable, but basically David was showing up to our site sort of around the UK when, when we first started doing talks and just offering expertise and, and being a great colleague. And then we realized at a certain point, basically that he was courting us. And one day he just said, you know, look at my geophys. Would you like to dig on Lindisfarne? And we were like, Lindisfarne, oh my God, yes. So um, he basically had been working there since 2014. 
um, National Geographic had paid for the geophys. And, um, but what he didn't have, surprisingly, for such an iconic place was any money or a dig team. So we decided that given the importance of the site um, and the many different communities of interest that it touches, you, you know, it's not just the early medievalists, it's not just the religious community, it's not just the fishing village, you know, there's these international communities of interest for whom the site has great meaning, that this would be a fantastic opportunity to, to run a big crowdfund that would obviously also operate as a training dig for the Durham University students and the kinds of people whom we call venturers who tend to join dig ventures across all of our sites. So we launched the crowdfund. Um, and I think we sold out or reached our goal within 24 hours um, of the first launch ever in 2016, um, which was really mind boggling and obviously far exceeded our expectations of, of where this would go. I mean, personally, I'm one of those people like even now, every time we get ready to launch, I'm like, oh, God, this is the year that no one cares and no one's going to come and it's going to be terrible. And, ah. But um, touch wood so far that hasn't happened. And, and certainly Lindisfarne just really unusually for a crowdfund that's happening every year seems to just be increasing in interest and maintaining where it was before and like notching up on the, on the plateau. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with how the crowdfunding works on archaeology, the, the entry level is 10 pounds all the way up and that that's a, a digital virtual level. So the first couple of financial levels that you can join the campaign, which is 10 to 25 to 50 to 75, all of those our, um, our virtual uh, levels and about 50% of the people who participate and help us fund this research never actually come to site. They are part of our you know, virtual venture community around the world um, and they, they consume the sort of feeling of being on site through our digital channels. And then from there and above, you can contribute to the campaign and then actually join us on site either through working in the on-site finds room. We do a lot of processing on this site. Um, or as part of the dig team in the trenches, anywhere from a day to two days to a week to the full three weeks of the dig. So um, that's basically how the crowdfund works. Um, and as we see here on the slide, this research, amazingly, um, is exclusively funded through crowdfunding. Um, there would not, this dig would not be happening, these discoveries would not be main, being made if it wasn't for the potential of actually using our model on this site. Um, and it is also really, really important to us as ethical archaeologists that there is plenty available for people who cannot participate in our crowdfund. From the beginning that Dig Ventures was established, at least 10% of all of our dig places um, are, are done on a sort of as need basis. We have people all the time with us who, who um, financially wouldn't be able to afford it, but are there um, through our community support. And we also have a ton of content, daily blogs, videos, um, announcements from site, you know, there's a ton of stuff that we do for free because we don't believe that there should be any sort of a paywall in between people um, being able to find out what's going on. And, and the trenches are very much open to visit. Lindsay visited this summer. Um, I don't know if I was on site when she came by. I, I wasn't there for the whole time this year, but um, it's free to visit. And, and actually we get a huge amount of foot traffic. I think after the first year, I checked the Northumberland official tourism numbers and something like 72,000 people had gone to Lindisfarne uh, the, the month that we were on site. And given that our trenches are situated immediately in front of the existing ruins and then triangulated between the pub and the hoof, which is where you get the good views, I'm pretty sure that all 72,000 must have walked by the trenches and probably asked me a question. So um, it's a very high volume site. That is one of the challenges of doing this kind of archaeology um, that is publicly accessible on, a, on an island which gets the Thai tourism because the, that interaction is immediate um, as well as you know virtual. So as it says here, we've raised now with counting this season's numbers, oh, just over 230,000 pounds for this site. And we are immensely proud. It is an incredibly um, vibrant and dedicated community of people, 872 people, almost 500 have been on site with us. Um, either in the finds room or the trenches, and um, 388 watching from a distance, plus, of course, the students. Uh, we're working with Durham, we're working with Cardiff, we're working with Cambridge, you know, there are a bunch of universities in the background who are facing their own challenges now in terms of where to send their students to dig. And this is one of those sites where it has such great infrastructure that we're sort of picking up more students um, each year as we go. Um, this year is the seventh season. Um, incredible that we've been there for so long. It feels like home now in many, many ways. And then we have a total of, of 10 plans. So we're, we're moving into the sort of downslope um, with tons left actually to, to find. Um, 
What are the results? Where do things stand? Well, we have identified the early monastic complex, which is incredibly exciting, as you might imagine. Um, the material culture that we have found includes uh, personal items that would have been used by either the monks or the lay community there. Um, significant evidence of a metalworking area, which might be a smithy. It, it might be. Um, there's a lime kiln for sure. There's other stuff going on. We're still waiting for the lab results on that. Structural evidence of buildings from the period, um, and obviously human remains. There's there's a cemetery there, which you know is just layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And we're hoping to. We have found natural in one area, and we're hoping to bottom out another place to, to just to find out how deep it really goes. Um, although it's, it is hard to find natural on this site. Um, there have been some star finds, which I'm sure some of you will have seen hit the press. Um, some some Anglo-Saxon name stones, which would have been grave markers, um, exactly like the ones you can see in the collection at the English Heritage Museum there. The sort of very typically round topped versus the square topped ones that you would find at Hartlepool. Um, the glass game piece, of course, blue and white beauty that made absolutely international headlines last year. I think I have um, like screen grabs of of news articles in about 17 different languages. It really was a thrill for me to see it like show up in Japanese and all these other sort of unusual places. Um, and then this past season, sort of less publicized up till now, but still present, um, we have found a chest burial, very indicative of the time and place and period. Um, and what we have is a very well preserved lock plate from that, which is still in the lab and undergoing um, some further analysis. So that comes from an area of, of the site where people were calling it a shrine, you know, clearly something very interesting is going on there. That's part of what will be opening up again this season. So um, all I can say to you really is tune in um, and stay tuned because the results will be coming for the next few years. Um, what I do want to say, which is also part of our model about this, is that everything we have done so far and everything we will do um, is available online through through what we call the digital dig team project page. Each one of our projects has their own um, sort of mini website within our overall website, which is called a digital dig team. And this hosts something really, really special, which is um, our digital recording system data. So we are standing over the trenches with iPads and phones and digital devices that rather than recording on paper, it all goes straight into digital dig team and then will appear instantly online because it's it's a web enabled, um, not a closed system, it's an open system. So um, the raw data from the trenches, also on the reports page, all of our um, sort of assessment reports, project designs, um, and the interim report will be there. So I've, I put here at the bottom of the page a screen grab. If, if you go to our website, it's the projects.digventures.com link for Lindisfarne. And then if you look at the screen grab that I've put here and you go into like the into the blue bar in the middle, you will see the different sections of that digital dig team website where you can find information. If you click on background, it's just a history, a, a very, very potted history of the site, um, as well as um, the sort of uh, plans that we had made in the beginning with Durham team is all of the people who are on site with us, but equally all of the people who have funded the campaign. Timeline um, is where we are producing sort of updates periodically throughout each day of the dig across social media, where our ventures or other people are posting. We try to pull it all together in one place, and it, it does help to give you a sense of what's happening at any given moment. And then the dig records is the really important one. That's where you can click and see what's actually coming up in the trenches, our 3D models on Sketchfab, trench ortho photos, uh, artifact models, as well as all of the reports. So I know that there will be some of you sitting there going more Lindisfarne, all Lindisfarne, all day, that's all we want. Um, I hope that that will be enough for you, but if not, you can get in touch with us after and we can do our best to satisfy your curiosity. Um, additionally, I wanted to mention that the clip that you saw in the beginning was a trailer for Why We Dig. This is on our watch pages. The link there is down at the bottom, digventures.com watch. Um, this is a mini series filmed completely on the dig last year, uh, sorry, in 2019, 2020. And um, it takes you a little bit more in depth and sort of side by side with our team and ventures as we are, you know, sort of completing one of the seasons. Uh, it's a really, it's meant to be fun and it's meant to be accessible, but there's a, a wealth of information in there. So you can also sort of consume the Lindisfarne seasons, um, previous seasons to that as well are also up on that platform. We sort of are calling it dig flicks within the team because of course why not but there you go have do have a look um 
And now Brendan is going to chat to you a little bit more about the different component pieces that go into us being able to do archaeology in this way. Sure. So um, clearly under, under the bonnet, there's going to be a lot of very familiar um, aspects. Um, we dig many scheduled sites, um, although this, this part of Lindisfarne isn't. So, so the way that we uh, project design is, is in the same way that you would access um, scheduled monument consent. So, um, you know, more project designs and assessment reports after each year and so on. But I think how we get to that place, um, how we fund it, how we build, how we create um, the knowledge that comes forth from those projects is, is quite different. Um, but you might be wondering whether it, it's, you know, just the same, maybe old wine, new bottles, just a dig with a maybe fancier website or flashier Facebook feed. Now, what I would like to do is try and position this model of archaeology um, alongside other similar initiatives that have been taking place in the cultural um, or, or social enterprise space, particularly those that have been um, helped or framed by Nesta, the UK innovation charity, or the, the, the innovation um, foundation. And they thought long and hard about this new kind of, this new model of, of collaborative work, whether that's through uh, websites such as Wikipedia or Airbnb or, or other things, um, where they've tried to, tried to distill uh, the, the base ingredients so that similar organizations who are ourselves social enterprises can really take that knowledge and use that to, to, to redesign their operational um, or business models. And um, whereas um, uh, Silicon Valley might be uh, trying to move fast and break things, um, Nesta's model is trying to help organizations like our socially minded organizations to move fast and fix things. And to do that, they started off with a typology to describe all of the different organizations that, that are active um, in this collaborative space. Now, these pillars have some very basic uh, and common features. They enable access um, instead of ownership of a, of a thing. And they encourage decentralized networks over centralized institutions. And they tend to unlock wealth and that's um, val or value that's with or without money. So from collaborative resourcing models um, like Airbnb on the left to collaborative finance models um, like Kickstarter to collaborative production and like Wikipedia and collaborative learning, um, like FutureLearn and, and other MOOCs, these organizations draw on platform economics, making use of idle assets to create new uh, marketplaces and in so doing challenge traditional ways of thinking about value and exchange. So positioning Dig Ventures um, uh, work and, and all of the experiments we do within the collaborative economy certainly fits with our experience of this hybrid, what you might call a new power and an old power model. But rather than focus on one of those pillars, um, we, we've designed something across all four of them, um, using archeology span as, as, as a theme to build a community of interest around our work. So starting with collaborative resources, we begin with the archeological resource, the, 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 the material remains itself. And we've built up a model that links up the owners of, 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 of archaeology or custodians of heritage assets with this networked global community around the world who want to learn, understand and enjoy those resources. Now, this is underpinned by a collaborative finance model, which we've used through crowdfunding to generate income and non-financial contributions from a networked community. Um, through crowdfunding or crowdsourcing. Well, before you move on, what I want to say is those are the dates for this year's digs. So, Lindsay, um, if you want to come on over, that's when we'll be there. And anybody else who wants to join us, please do feel free to come on by and say hello. More the merrier. Yes. Um, and of course, crowdfunding isn't just about raising money. In fact, if that's what you're, you're focused on, then you're really missing the point. It's about building deeply engaged audiences who want to behave not as mere consumers of the work, um, but as partners in its production. And to enable this, we've, we've built um, something called Digital Dig Team, as Lisa mentioned earlier, so that participants on our sites can publish data, including text, photos, 3D models, directly from the trenches using their smartphones or tablets, harnessing comments from, and contributions from the crowd on their work. But being radically 
like this and it is radically open every single piece of data from a context upwards has its own web page which publishes the moment it's created but that doesn't just that doesn't remove all barriers to participation publishing our data in real time has a little point if only a very small number of people can actually understand it and have the skills um, to inter interrogate it so this led us to build a collaborative learning platform or, or MOOC platform within our website and um, to deepen our community's engagement with our practice. For those listening who don't know, MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course. And it's something that we tend to say quite a lot in shorthand. So if, if we do end up forgetting to explain it, then you'll be like, MOOC, MOOC, what is this? Is there, you know, anyway, yeah. that's what it is. Not always massive, <laughs> but we have the occasional. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. Um, so I thought this was really well encapsulated by um, this marvelous tweet from one of our participants that shows with an intentionally designed digital platform, a peer to peer approach to archaeology, we can truly work, uh, turn watching into doing. And it's this approach to digital is, is so much more than the way I feel most of the sector thinks of digital, which is to try and create an efficiency around our existing operational or business models. Rather than thinking of it as an as a, as a efficiency, we can reframe it as a system or a platform to change how we fund, resource, communicate our science. Over to you. Okay, so with that in mind, um, that's kind of where we started. And then of course, um, everything's in full swing, it's all going great, and um, we all come to what happened uh, with COVID-19, which has changed us in, in many, many ways. So um, I want to now share with you another short video about the next project that we're going to discuss with you because it's been a springboard um, and, and really changed our, our operations um, moving into the future. So bear with me. Here we go. The story of our project, Archaeology at Home, it's really a story about what happened to all of us last year with the global pandemic. We had to ask ourselves, what does this mean for us as archaeologists? What does this mean for our community? What does it mean if we can't actually do our work together with people? And our immediate reaction and response was, what can we do to help? What surprised us most in the end about this project was that our biggest hurdle, the challenge of this huge disconnect, actually became our biggest win. Archaeology at Home really tapped into that deep human desire to connect, in this case through a shared passion for archaeology. For Archaeology at Home, we leaned totally into creating opportunities for our community to come together online. We held pub quizzes and virtual site tours, we led an online virtual field school, and we ran a weekend online festival all about archaeology. Our virtual field school became an absolute flagship moment for us. Thousands of people all over the world all signed up together to learn about how to do archaeology. Everything from how do you plan an excavation to what do you do with your artifacts afterward, the ethics of digging, and it created this fantastic community who shared their passion for doing archaeology and, and also brought in all these elements of the heritage of their places. We also turned our signature archaeology festival, Dignation, into a completely online event. And we put out an open call to professional archaeologists and researchers all over the world. And we said, send us a presentation, you know, send us a video about your work. What should you have been doing this summer? Where are we supposed to be digging? And the international response was actually astounding. Because of the pandemic, our physical participation went down by 75%. But at the same time, people taking advantage of our online activities, our digital participation went up by 3,100%. Archaeology at Home ended up bringing in 11,000 people across 90 countries, all to do archaeology together. For Dignation alone for the festival, we had 32 presentations from 26 different countries, joining the 8,000 people from 81 countries for the course. Now, this was an entirely new audience for Dig Ventures. And surprisingly, archaeology was also new to nearly 80% of the people who joined us for the project. This is one of the most exciting and important impacts of archaeology at home. It united citizens with professional archaeologists and researchers across the world on an entirely new scale, and it introduced archaeology to a whole new audience. 
we think that this is what the future looks like for archaeology and heritage. Our project shows that even when people can't visit a site or participate in person, their enthusiasm to be involved absolutely endures. It's up to us to create those opportunities, to encourage that interest, and to grow that enthusiasm. Nice I feel exhausted just watching that back thing. That was such hard work. Uh, actually, digital events are about three times as much prep. I'm sure we all know by now as actual physical ones, and that was a lot of work. So um, what I want to say about archaeology at home is this really was a turning point for us. Um, as we said in the video, we won the Europa Nostra Award for this work because of the, the incredible reach and the sort of European significance of it. And um, we also won a Europeana, European Museums Association Heritage in Motion Innovation Prize um, just, just for the sort of methodology that and the website access that, that it created. So um, it was a major impact success. It was just a, I can still remember, you know, if we can all cast our minds back to March um, 2020 when the first lockdown happened, it was like this simultaneous awareness that not only were all, every, all the people at home, that all these archaeologists were also at home, and we had this incredible wealth of information to share. You know, we should have all been out doing research, and none of us could, but there had to be a way to at least um, continue to put that research in front of people, but equally for us all to experience the thrill of our own work and, you know, talk about that in, in a really meaningful way. So um, what's also important is that it, we did really think hard about how to evaluate the, the impact of this work. And what we have heard consistently back from our crowd, the, the 11,000 people in actually 91 countries, is more please. Um, we were chatting a little bit about this um, with the RAI committee before we came online today, which is that you know that hybrid uh, potential, doing things in person, but as well as having an online option, has become one of the most important aspects of this, this pandemic, I think, is accelerating uh, organizations making those things possible and it isn't just about you know geography it's about people's financial situations their health situations beyond even covid um you know whether or not they they're differently abled or whether or not they actually even want to travel given what we're all thinking and feeling now about the climate emergencies so we we really feel that this hybrid model is important and actually because heritage and, and archaeology in particular um we have so much of the built-in storytelling and so much of that emotional connection that's important for bringing people together online. We're really in a position to completely lead on this kind of work. Um, what we have seen is that, um, that how do we monetize our content? You know, that's one of those terrible phrases that has emerged in the culture culture sector out of out of the pandemic. Is you know we don't want to put all the effort. This three times as much work into digital operations if we can't figure out instantly how to make money off of it you know D you know showing up to give a lecture to a room full of maybe five people was something you know that we all used to do kind of just because that's what you did but when you throw an online event and only five people show up you know it's a much bigger question about whether or not it continues to be worth it to do that for your organization um so what we've seen is big european and you know british also um cultural heritage institutions shy away from developing a really mature digital offer because they're just not seeing that impact on their bottom line so what we would like to say is it might not be immediate gratification you might not do one thing and then all of a sudden sh see that showing up on your bottom line but leaning into a really good strategic plan for that um and, and being able to quantify what you're getting back from it beyond finances which is it's where we sort of live is the beyond finances part is going to see huge benefits so one of the things we're most proud of is that um, with archaeology at home almost 30 percent so 29 percent of the people who consume this um have have said that the long-term impact of their experience with the project is that they're going to do more volunteering in the sector and i mean you know taking someone who might have never done anything previously and moving them into someone who's going to be actively involved in doing this work is like such a huge win and think how think about what that means you know for someone's life and how they understand their place and what it means to be an active citizen in their communities i'm really 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 excited about that um 82% declaring they would seek out further opportunities, which is just stupendous. 
Um, there were also benefits for heritage within the project. So production of new knowledge. Uh, we did have a, a, a sort of furloughed wedding photographer discover a new henge in Derbyshire. Uh, it did turn out in the end that um, it was already in the HER, but the HER isn't publicly available. So one could argue um, that it was new, uh, but anyway, it made his day and certainly ours as well. Um, and I just wanted to share with you a distribution map of where everybody came from um, for the virtual field school. So the way that worked is we released um, every week one chapter of our online course, How to Do Archaeology, and we guided the cohorts. So our team would be in, you know, teaching people in the Facebook study group, answering questions by email, helping to guide people through their learning. And, you know, we then saw the participants of the course starting to interact with each other. You know, we almost became redundant in the process and sharing a lot of experiences um, that were far beyond just talking about the course. You know, it was a really high pressure moment in the pandemic. And, you know, we were seeing lots of interactions where they were helping each other deal with either having COVID or the effects of it or other kinds of health diagnosis, job loss. You know, it was a really intense moment that we saw coming together around this sort of shared medium of archaeology so it was it was amazing to be a part of it and it's it's always fun to see sort of where everybody comes from um who joined us for that and you know we did take a really hard or close look at who these people were and i think one of the most interesting um sort of evidences on this page if you look at, at this big orange bar here and you look at who those people are those are the the people who were home on furlough basically and that made up the bulk of our audience you know these were people who couldn't go to work and chose to spend their time you know this this time at home with us so you know we were we were really impressed by that and actually if you look that has i think a direct bearing on the age of uh, the virtual field school participants um, if you're close to the sector, you will know that one of the things we struggle with is reaching young people or broadening out membership, for example, in archaeological societies to a younger demographic. And so we were really pleased um, to see that that this uh, the virtual field school actually did bring in some people who were, you know, by and large, much younger than what we would normally see, for example, in, in other kinds of society or, or whatever activities. So that is also something that we were quite happy about. And we looked a lot into their um, their motivation and the impact that actually being a part of it uh, had on their lives. One of the, the consequences we talked about volunteering, some people have indicated to us they might go into further study. There were people who were ready to chuck in their whole life and just become an archaeologist. And that's when we would like call in reinforcements and do our best to like talk them out of it, <laughs> probably. But um, it was really it's fantastic to watch people being moved um, by participating. And then this is just a a screen grab. I wanted to show you guys what the, the virtual festival actually looked like when it was online. We paid a, a lot of attention to designing something that was usable no matter what kind of a device you had. You know, as we've discovered over time, you know, with schools particularly, not every child is at home with a laptop, not every person is at home with a laptop. You know, what kinds of devices can they get access to in public spaces? You know, the majority of people will at least have a mobile phone. So that was something that we worked into our design for all of these activities. And then for the festival, this is where the projects came from. The white dots are where we had our speakers from. We're very, very um, proud of the sort of distribution of that. And obviously, we can do much better in uh, Iceland and Greenland. We're working on that. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then, then this is where the folks who consume the content were from as well. Um, and finally, the last thing I really wanted to say about this is it has changed, the, you know, COVID changed the way that we did archaeology. In the physical processes on site, we now train people and move people around the site in a one-way system. We have developed a pods um, system as well, which in, to our great surprise has actually improved our teaching um, across all of our sites. And these are things that we will most likely hang on to as we move um, into being sort of less immediately concerned on site about the impacts of COVID. Um, but one of the big things that happened dur during the lockdowns for us is that we had just opened our first ever subscriptions model so people can become a subscriber to DV. And we also had an online tip jar because all of the content that we did during the lockdowns was free. You know, it was definitely something that we felt we wanted to give back and to offer out because we had it. And we just said, if you like what we're doing, you know, you can 
join the team and you know become a subscriber you can leave us a tip and you know we were amazed at the amount of people who wanted to contribute in that way and due to the high volume of the take up that revenue stream is now more than our entire retail offer for the preceding year in 2019. so our subscribers continue to grow we hear from them a lot about what they want more of and we're, we're racing as fast as we can to make sure that the kinds of content and opportunities that we are offering is exactly what want what they want to help keep them engaged in archaeology not just with us but with the sector the more people who care about archaeology right now really the better um, in, in this particular climate we're in um, the fifth trench which is what we've sort of always um, jokingly called our social media side and our, our outward facing outreach side of the team um, has become really 50 percent of the business now it was always kind of subservient to the trenches so something would happen on a dig uh, or in the lab and you know then then we would we would move that outward in into the outreach into the digital but now what we've realized is actually it's its own world and it needs to be thought of and and resourced just as you would resource a dig so we have those two pillars of the business now and everything that we do moving forward is going to be equally split across both of those we found a really fantastic community of practice with um international peers including meeting and, and being able to interact with people who've never previously spoken about their work outside of academia. So that is something that continues to grow and continues to really inform our practice. Really happy about that. Um, and another um, legacy and future of this is that we believe that um, the project Archaeology at Home sort of provides a scalable template for other organizations to adopt to help them deal with what the sort of new normal is going to look like for them as an organization. How do we operate in a, in a, in a world where there's a changing tourism landscape, for example? People aren't necessarily going to cities anymore. They're, they're going to rural places or outdoor sites. A lot of those places aren't set up to deal with a high visitation and don't have any digital offer at all. You know, what, is, what does all of this mean and how, how can those organizations and sites harness um, the, the potential of this new way of working? And um, so finally, we were, you know, we were in a very unique place when the pandemic first started because we were born digital. So um, we were sort of already in the place that many organizations got accelerated into as a result of being forced into it by needing to be more digital because of the pandemic. But the pandemic also accelerated the way that DV operates as well. And it, and it took us to an entirely new place um, with our, our forward operations, which Brendan is gonna talk to you a little bit about now. Good stuff. So we're into the R&D uh, <laughs> phase of the presentation. So deep time, um, as Lisa mentioned, was something that, that really came through um, our experience of COVID, particularly the first lockdown, where we saw the benefits of people coming together um, digitally were wonderful in terms of their own um, experience. But as well as this, some really good and interesting archaeology got done. Lisa mentioned the uh, furloughed wedding photographer Chris Snedden and finding you know the the, the um, a, a potential new henge monument. Well other sites kept bubbled up as well and we thought well this is this is a really fantastic opportunity. And we with that we thought well as we push on into a post pandemic future, what can we learn from this? How can we pivot our crowd model, which for the last 10 years has been focused on the act of digging and all of the things that we've learned in terms of managing participation and people with no previous experience in the digging phase, how can we move that upstream to the reconnaissance and spatial planning phase of archaeology? And it's at this point that we started talking to um, someone called Iris Kramer, who had just uh, graduated from a PhD in Southampton. In, in machine learning and artificial intelligence, who just launched a, a new business called RKI. And we built a, a model of how we could join the crowd up with machine learning to find new archaeology um, that's never been discovered from LIDAR, tiles and satellite imagery. Um, we then went to our favorite people in the world, uh, both um, Discover Brightwater, our client up here in, in County Durham, um, as well as Nesta, uh, their Centre for Collective Intelligence Design, who helped us fund a small pilot project to prototype a model um, joining uh, the crowd and machine learning to identify archaeology. Now, why, why is this an important um, uh, challenge for us? Well, it's, it's a spatial planning issue. Of course, there are proposed changes um, to the Planning Act. But more broadly speak, uh, th than that, there are uh, you know, huge impacts through um, global warming in terms of uh, impact on, on coastal erosion, but also 
um, are large-scale landscape change responses to, to global warming, such as reforestation um, or carbon capture through, um, through peat bogs. Now, this is happening in areas where we have a knowledge of what's going on through the HER, um, but it's a variable knowledge. Um, it's a database that has some very good bits, but other, other bits that have originated over the last 100 years that aren't, aren't perhaps our um, uh, best foot forward. So in an area of lowland Durham called um, Brightwater, a 220 square kilometre area, we set up this model to, to try this experiment to see if in the first instance we could see whether the method worked, that's our hypothesis one, you know, whether we can apply what's called CI or collective intelligence, that collaborative uh, model that I described earlier on, with AI or machine learning uh, to refine the baseline data within the HER, both its quality and quantity. And then our second hypothesis was, you know, what's the impact of participating in this model? And um, what happens if we take a, a bunch of people who've no previous experience with archaeology, put them through um, our, our process, and, and what happens on the, on the other end? What changes for them as a consequence? We were particularly interested to try and understand whether they had a closer sense of, of ownership and control on the planning process and decisions that may ultimately impact their lives, as well as a closer connection to the landscape, and particularly the one that they were studying. Go on. So to do this, we built a, a, a model. This is called a human in the loop model. So we started with our HER um, database. We then brought that into our back end um, systems and, and cleaned that up to some extent, taking out the events. So all we wanted was the sites. We found that our HER for um, County Durham had around about 4,000 um, uh, 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 data, data points in there. Some were points, some were polygons, but it's a very mixed bag. And we then brought that into a participatory GIS. This is something we built from the ground up that allowed the crowd to make annotations onto LIDAR um, around sites that they were identifying, as well as complete metadata tables to describe what those sites were, were to categorize um, the site type and monument type and, and enter descriptions as well. Now that data was then gonna be used to, to train an AI, a training, a training AI data set that could then be used by the AI to look at um, a percentage of that area, but then an, an additional area that the crowd hadn't looked at already. And that would, would generate all kinds of, of, of um, good identifications, but a number of uh, poor identifications as well, and um, false positives, if you will, which the crowd would then um, weed out and validate. And then at the end of that uh, process, the idea was that we would have a uh, enriched um, uh, HER data set that we could then pass back um, to Durham County Council. Now I'm going to talk about some of those um, things in a second. Um, the AI bit didn't work quite as well as we did, but the crowd aspect was phenomenal. Um, our crowd were called Pastronauts <laughs> for um, a number of different reasons. Um, but essentially, because we knew that there was going to be turbulence on, on this journey, and um, we wanted our crowd to be as, as uh, with us as possible um, along that quite bumpy ride. We were um, discovering features on the surface of a new planet. LIDAR looks a bit like the moon. So Pastor not just uh, bubbled up to the fore, and um, that's, that's what we called our crowd. There we go. Oh, okay. Okay. There we go. Good stuff. So in terms of recruitment, so it's often a challenge for crowdsourcing uh, projects in order to, to kind of bring the, the participants um, 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 in, into the project. That wasn't a problem um, for us. We had nearly a thousand participants and um, for a hundred places. You know, this was an absolutely phenomenal uh, response. Um, and that was that was fantastic for us in terms of um, um, whittling down um, that number into our, our hundred um, pastronauts. Um, it was only open for a month. We pushed that through our mailing list and on our website, and the response was amazing. Um, now, this is what, in, in terms of the demographics of the of the um, that, that large applicant group, that this is what it looks like. As you can see, it's 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 much better than what you might expect through traditional. 
um, heritage volunteering or um, who, whoever might go to an open day or so on. But you can still see that there's a slight um, variance. This isn't the exact kind of uh, demographic you might find typically walking um, down the high street. And it was very important to us that we, we, we made our, our passion art group as equitable and as democratic as possible. Of course, another um, aspect of, of COVID lockdown that we've seen is, is big heritage moments like uh, the Edward Colston statue um, coming down and other aspects of Black Lives Matter that have really brought home to us as heritage professionals that not all groups in society have an equal lever um, on, on the work that, that we do. So it was very important to us that we didn't um, take those off, on, uh, offline balances and just replicate them online. So having that thousand people to begin with, we could then bring that down to the next um, level and really even that out. So you can see on the left there, our age profiles are much more evenly balanced. No, no group more than 20%. Our socioeconomics on the top right um, is also um, relatively even, but particularly our ethnic background there, 75% and um, white, the remainder coming from ethnic um, minorities of various different groups, it was really important to us that we brought that in, into our passion or community. But the other aspect as well that we, we selected on um, was that we didn't want just a, a whole bunch of people that do this all, all of the time. Um, so some 26% of people had never touched archaeology in any way whatsoever um, before. And a further 66% had only done that either volunteering um, with us or, or with other groups. And there's a very, very small um, percentage, 8% of people who are professional archaeologists, so priming the pump to some extent. So in addition to, 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 to that, the other thing that we selected for is a third of the participants um, were from the local area, they were from County Durham, so had that connection to landscape. So that was all very important in how we um, uh, curated that, that passionate community. Now, because we're starting with people with no previous experience um, before, and we're trying to get them to a point where they can make professionally valid contributions, then we, had, we, can, we can't just let them map the map and say, knock yourself out. So what we did is we embedded our participatory GIS within an eight week course, which took participants from zero all the way up to being able um, to, to identify features. Um, and as, as well as that, we had an inbuilt chat function um, within that environment so that they could help each other out as they went along so that we didn't have to be um, everywhere. This is what 220 square kilometers look like. And our, our map started blue and ended green. And we were generally pretty addicted to refreshing um, the screen every <laughs> single second. Um, for those involved in crowdsourcing, this was a single track validation process. So when we scale a process like this, we're trying to minimize the amount of professional um, touch points as possible. Otherwise, we may as well just do all the work ourselves. So it was almost like passing your answers to a, a table next to you when you do a pub quiz. Um, we did a, a buddy system where, where um, our passion arts could help each other out and validate each other's um, work. So what does look, this look like in terms of the results of this um, project? Um, well, uh, the, 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 the crowd's tran transcriptions were um, absolutely um, phenomenal. Um, they they recognised some 3,670 um, new sites. So that's that's them on the left. And on the right hand side, you can see where that overlies with what's in the HER already. And that's another 1,300 um, sites. So we've improved um, 1,300 sites from the HER, which were points and they're now polygonized. Um, and we found um, the exact number is 2,361 new sites, a 60% uplift um, in, in archaeology now um, in the HER. Now, of course, quantity is, is one thing, but what about the quality um, of that work? And there's no real agreed methodology for measuring the quality of the HER. So we created one and we based it on three metrics. Fidelity, which is the match between the label um, and, the, and the site itself. 
um, uh, uh, accuracy, which is how well the polygon matches the outline of the feature, and completeness, which is how, how much of the metadata associated um, with that is, is completed. So as you can see, um, in terms of the quality order against those um, metrics, if we were to average um, the, the uh, crowds-based data, the crowd produced uh, data at a 94% accuracy compared with what exists in the HER, which is an 88% accuracy. And now finally, for that second um, hypothesis, what does this mean for people who actually take part? This is very interesting for us as a sector, because of course we, we, we struggle to some extent, particularly in development led archeology span to allow people in or to understand what archeology span does um, to, to, to change um, them. Now here we see um, our question, um, you know, what, what um, changed for you as a consequence of taking part? How, what was your connection um, with the landscape? So prior to, um, um, Prior to, to taking part, about 75% were, were relatively nonplussed by the Brightwater um, study area. They had no real connection um, to it. But after the project, that completely flipped and some 75% had a strong connection to the Brightwater study area, 32% especially so. And when we think about then also um, what, how that changed our understanding of archaeology in the planning process, and prior to taking part, 6% of people knew nothing of archaeology in the planning process. 24% were pretty uncertain of its role, and 48% knew a little bit. And by the end, some 96% of people agreed that their understanding of it had completely changed, 50% especially so. So we end up with this model, which creates more quantity and quality of archaeology in, in the planning process. Um, does it at a scale which is far bigger than archaeologists could possibly do uh, themselves? And does it in a way which, which connects people back into landscape and makes them feel more in control of, of those planning decisions? Um, we're super excited by this. <laughs> um, I'm looking for, that was the pilot project, looking for partners and ways to, to, to move this forward. So if there's anyone out there who has some good ideas, uh, on that, we'd be really delighted to hear. Before we go, um, there are these um, papers. There is some rigor to this, <laughs> uh, to the jazz hands. These are all published papers which talk about some of the uh, recent work that we've done. Um, Lisa's mentioned where you can find um, much more about Lindis Farm as well. Yes, yeah, so, um, so that's really the end of the sort of information that we've got to share with you tonight. I'll leave this slide up for a bit so that those who want to copy down the references have a chance. And then after that, I'll, I'll put up Brendan in my contact details so, so that if anybody wants to reach out directly, you can do so. But thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, at a time when the Royal Archaeological Institute has just had a review and is looking forward to the next 50 years of its existence, you've given us a great deal to think about there, um, particularly about where archaeology is going. And the world is changing, and particularly the world of archaeology, and I think you've shown that very nicely. Um, if anybody has any questions, if you could put it in the chat box, um, we'll try and um, field them. But while we're waiting for people to think of things, um, would you like to perhaps just sum up in a few minutes where you think you are with the excavations at Lindisfarne? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> You've got us there. Yeah. Well, I mean, we as as we said, we we have found um, we have found the early medieval monastery, and you know we have a significant amount of material culture. Um, the we're trying to cut back on the area of the the cemetery that we're excavating because obviously it's um, excavating human remains can only tell you so much, and unless you're finding some with grave goods and what have you, it seems to be. Uh, an exercise in just increasing your post ex budget. Um, so so we're, we're starting to move away from those areas and expanding the trenches um, more towards the, the upstanding priory remains, because we do believe, looking at the geophys and at the structural remains that we've got, that as we creep closer and closer to that original um, 
boundary there that there's probably going to be quite a bit more of the early monastery there. So originally we had sort of avoided it because there's a big dip as you sort of head up to the fence there and it gets a little bit challenging, but we're just going to move the spoil heaps around so that we can get um, at least three to five meters closer. Um, and looking on the geophys and on some updated geophys that we did um, in uh, a couple of years ago, it's looking quite good like there might be some more structural evidence there that would relate to an earlier phase. So that's where we're heading. We've got uh, three more seasons, fingers crossed, and tons to do. We're also picking up um, some other features on the other side of the pathway. So the, the, that field that is unscheduled is bisected by the pathway between, between the village and the hyuf. And on the other side, we're opening up some trenches over some anomalies on the geophys. Some look like ditches. Some are like, who knows what they are. So it's time to, to ground truth some of that so we don't leave it undone when we leave site. The, the, the most exciting part of this is structural structures, but one looks like a potential high status smithy um, you know, right, right in the center of, of the monastic complex. So um, we're quite excited by that. But everything is so heavily truncated that it's taking a ferocious amount of time to, to dig it. Um, and particularly that feature, um, which is truncated by a, a, a 12th century um, lime kiln, basically a cement mixer, the Benedictine Priory. Um, so, um, so, so it's, it's very complex archaeology. The other aspect to it is, although there's, there are burials left, right, and centre, there are no grave cuts either. Um, so it, it takes an awful long time to, to do anything and to, to really focus in on our areas. The, the most exciting thing for me certainly is that the potential high status smithy we had Jerry McDonnell out last year um, and um, you know we this is the year that we're hoping to to expose more of that and really, really target our, our resources on it. Yes and of course we've only found one glass game piece which if it's part of a set if it's anything like Birka we should be looking for quite a few more so I'm going to just be greedy and ask the universe for that. Um, <laughs> Sure. <laughs> but you know, it's 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 always a it's a site of surprises. We just every year something else. I mean, the the, the chest burial last year had my heart pounding so hard. Um, so I'm sure that this season will will offer something similarly exciting. Well, I'm fascinated that even um, in the most modern excavation, you still have to keep moving the spoil tip around. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. It keeps us tethered to reality, doesn't it? <laughs> um, Brian, are there any comments that we um, need to read out? I'll ask Matt, because Matt can, least, only Matt can see the wider chat. Right. Uh, Ossian Law says, really good point about uh, perseverance online. The pandemic-induced explosion of online outreach has been something of a flash in in the Bain Murray for some organizations. Uh, keeping uh, Keep doing the live events. You will get an audience once the algorithm catches on, and you don't even have to do any video editing. And even if you have over a thousand subscribers, you can take donations via YouTube in addition to the ad revenue. Mm. Just a comment, I think. And, uh, Thank Diana, you. <laughs> Diana good, Flynn. Good encouragement. Says, uh, are you going to look at how long lasting are the positive changes to those who took part in the study? Mm. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, it's sometimes called the dosage question, you know, how much archaeology is too much or how much is too little. Um, like some archaeology three times after meals uh, and then what happens <laughs> six months later. Um, so we, we do like, our long running um, projects. We have long running evaluations. And in, in terms of the data that we collect to, to show how we move the needle for participants or, or communities, we ask them before um, they, they join us, various things, and we ask them after. And that can show, um, you know, in that kind of short-term window, um, what changes. Going beyond that is extraordinarily difficult, um, beyond the anecdotal, to, to really evidence. Um, do we contact people again in five years and say, how did it all work out for you? Um, it's it's tough, tough to do that. Anecdotally, we know that we, we, we're going to have to put something in the small print in our terms and conditions that if you decide to throw in your well-paid job and go back to college and be an archaeologist, you can't come back to us in the end <laughs> and, and blame, blame us. us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, 
but but we, we we perceive it anecdotally and it's just very difficult to 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 collect the evidence for uh andrew selkirk asks fantastic it Hi, is andrew. good to see see uh, see the future of archaeology um he asks how far have english heritage been helpful mm. Um, well, I'm, I'm guessing he probably means HE as is and EH as was. Um, uh, they've been very helpful, actually. They've funded us for a couple of projects. One is a peer-to-peer -peer learning project, which um, is, is now out of beta testing and will be launching quite shortly, trying to teach basically these behaviors that we have just been talking about, the, the audience building, the motivating your audience to help support you, whether financially or non-financially, and then also then turning around and evaluating that work and being able to express your impact. So they've supported us to build an online course for our peers doing that. Um, they've supported us at Cerny Wick, the famous David Attenborough site. Um, they've supported us on, in many different ways, actually. And um, it's fantastic, really, to, to be working with such a, an established um, part of the sector who are embracing innovation um, with varying levels of comfortability. I'm sure I can hear Andrew laughing right now. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's definitely been a journey with them and, and I really, we really appreciate the support we have been given. So. This, yeah, I mean, everything that we do when, when we dig a site, um, you know, there's no favours or special treatment no. for dig benches. You know, everything that we do has to be yeah. done under schedule. Monument concern, ex exhaustive MOF, compliant project designs and assessment reports and UPDs and, and so on. And, and, you know, when we first started Dig Ventures, we knew that we what we were doing was going to be relatively difficult for some people uh, to digest. So um, going above and beyond in terms of that quality and rigor was, was vital to us. Becoming a registered organization um, within the Chartered Institute for Archaeology is vitally important. Getting our processes second to none, so the output look exactly as you might um, expect in terms of academic yeah. rigor but how we get there is, is different and the two things going hand in hand I think have, have got buy-in um, from from some um, organizations that you might yeah. could be, believe might be more risk averse in, in traditional yeah. we still we are still receiving lots of red pen from AG though as well across everything it is quite painful <laughs> opening those emails but um, we appreciate them for their rigor let's say yeah. <laughs> yeah. all right thank you oh Brian, yeah, question. yeah you mentioned you got to David Attenborough right at the end um, are you <laughs> yeah. Is there any like to do any more field work on that site uh, or the, the amazing mammoth site? Are you or are you is it now post X only? Yeah. Do you think we could possibly walk away from that site at this well, point? We just found <laughs> five I mean, no. Of course we're gonna go back is the answer. Um the level of complexity um is so in incredible on a site that old, as you will well know with your professional background. Um, so what we intend to do is take a breath because the, the five small flint tools came out very close to the end of the dig. There is um, quite a lot of interesting stuff going on with the bones, you know, potential cut marks and other stuff. We are awaiting a set of DNA results. For those of you who haven't heard of the technique, um, it's actually extracting DNA from the sediments surrounding um, remains and, and archaeological objects. So those are in the hopper right now. And obviously we'll, we'll definitely have an impact on our next strategy. So um, we'll be reporting on the current phase of work in April both back to HE as part of our, our MORPH project design, as well as through an academic publication. We'll be meeting with the other site partners and protocols to set a research design for you know, you know, a few years moving forward, because it doesn't make sense for us to like fundraise for a season at a time. We need to really put a net around it to make sure that we've got a good plan to collect as much evidence as we can once we go back in. So the answer is absolutely yes, not in 2022, but we'll be back as soon as we can in 2023. And in between, there's going to be a lot of reporting and planning happening. Okay. No more Attenborough, though, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last call for questions. No. No. 
Okay. In which case, it falls to me to thank you for a fascinating multimedia presentation. Um, you've taken us from one of the sites that exemplifies the golden age of Northumbria, right, the way to a very different age of archaeology and one which has um, snuck up on, on many people, but I suspect is going to be the way forward. And I thank you very much for this evening's talk. It's given us a great deal to think about. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. That was great. Cheers. And I hope that our next um, lecture will be in uh, person in Burlington House again. Uh, watch this space and you'll find out what is going to happen then. But um, I thank you all for attending. Um, and I think that means that it's just us five now, is it? Yeah. Yes. Good stuff. Well done. Well done. <laughs> that was.